Hi folks, Seth Leibson here. Thanks for watching my monologue. In these uncertain times, you may be thinking about personal protection. If you are, I urge you to visit my friends at Guns Etc. They'll help you find the perfect protection for yourself and your family, and they can even teach you how to use it. They've been protecting Arizonans for over 33 years, and they stand for the great principles this country was founded upon. Or you can just click on GunsEtc.com. And if you like my monologues, please subscribe to 960 The Patriots' YouTube channel. Welcome back, and happy November 23rd, 2020. Amicus Plato said, Magis Amica Veritas. Aristotle purportedly said, meaning Plato is my friend, but truth is more dear. Piety requires us to honor truth above our friends, is how Aristotle put it in the Ethics. Elsewhere, he would write, among friends, there is no need for justice. I want to talk about all that, but hold it in mind as we discuss the reelings of the past couple of days, especially regarding the dispatch of Sidney Powell from President Trump's legal team. We come at this as a house and movement divided. Now, for several days, many had been hanging their hopes on what Sidney Powell was alleging. Loyal to Donald Trump, Powell had the goods and was going to save his re-election. Doesn't look that way anymore. She, the most vociferous of a widespread conspiracy to turn the election from Biden to Trump, has been fired. This raises the question, are we more loyal and dedicated to her version of the alleged conspiracy or to President Donald Trump? Ostensibly, we were resting hopes on Ms. Powell because of our loyalty to the president. But since his loyalty to her or her to his has been fractured, we ask where our loyalties lie. Have they, too, been fractured? It's the most reasonable of things to want to fight for your side with, a zealous, with as zealous as representation as possible. But when the client of an attorney has no more faith in that attorney, I think we have to admit we cannot have that faith either. The point was to re-elect Donald Trump, not elect Sidney Powell. Powell was in the service of Trump, who was in the service of us. That is the right order. This fracturing of the relationship obviously affects negatively the potential re-election of Donald Trump, which affects negatively all of us. This development cannot be overstated as it takes a big bite out of what Alan Dershowitz called the wholesale theory of election fraud. The retail argument is what various states experience with undercounts and overcounts and observer problems, etc. They, Dershowitz said yesterday, are probably not enough to change the purported outcome. The wholesale argument that computers may have turned hundreds of thousands of votes, Powell's argument, that presents serious constitutional problems that Dershowitz said could overturn the election but requires serious evidence, much more serious evidence, evidence we haven't seen. We will see how far Rudy Giuliani and Jenna Ellis and Joe DeGeneva take these claims. But as Scott Johnson points out this morning, we're moving from the Freudian pleasure principle to the reality principle, and I think that's right. But note one thing I'd mentioned a while ago. There's an ongoing assault on the Constitution by the Democratic Party, regardless of all that. We've talked about the First Amendment. We've talked about the Second Amendment. They've gone after the Fourth Amendment rights of Trump supporters and, of course, property and due process rights of the Fifth Amendment. And now, as I also pointed out was coming, elements or at least versions or theories around the Sixth Amendment, at least an inheritance of the Sixth Amendment right to counsel. I knew of several lawyers and law firms under pressure not to represent Donald Trump or the campaign in the various states and over the various claims of fraud going back for weeks. It was strong pressure from other clients, from the public, from, the public, from other lawyers internal at their firms. And now congressmen are filing bar complaints against lawyers who represented the campaign, past tense, filing bar complaints so that the lawyers who represented Trump or represent him now be disbarred can no longer work. As Jonathan Turley notes, New Jersey Democratic uh, Representative Bill Pascrell sent demands for New York and other states, including Arizona, to disbar roughly two dozen lawyers for representing Donald Trump, the Republican Party, or the Trump campaign in the litigation. While Democratic members and the media discuss attacks on democracy and the rule of law, they appear to have a little problem with campaigns to threaten and harass both lawyers and legislators 
for raising questions about this election. One might even call it a war against the law. This is the same congressman, by the way, who had written Donald Trump should be tried for treason last week. I really hope the evisceration of the Constitution the Democrats are engaging in is becoming more and more evident to more and more people. That many of us have been saying this for years will be made evident in more and more sharp relief, I believe. It seems to be if Joe Biden were serious about his calls for unity, he would shut down Pascrell's efforts, denounce them, and those of others doing the same. But this is all unlikely because it's who the Democrats are, a party reliant on destroying democratic norms they kept accusing us of breaking. For some time, we've asked or argued that we're in a civil, are we in a civil war in America? I thought it was actually worse, that we are in a revolutionary war. The reason I say this is because the Democrats have been trying to convert our original revolution into a nullity. All men created equal, gone. Liberty is an unalienable right, gone. 1776, meaningless. Some other date, more important. And of course, the attacks on the first, second, fourth, fifth, and now sixth amendments. David Horowitz put it even stronger. Republicans can still be heard referring to Democrats as liberals when it is obvious even to them that there is nothing liberal about their principles or methods. They are destroying the First Amendment in our universities, on the Internet, and our once but no longer free press. Suffice it to note that while Democrats accuse Republicans, including the president, of being racists and traitors, the response of Republican leaders is, well, the Democrats are just playing politics. Today's Democrat Party is a party of character, assassins, and indeed racists. Republicans know this, but are reluctant to say it. That is how a pathological liar and corrupt politician like Joe Biden can accuse the choice of 73 million Americans of being a white supremacist and also murdering 200,000 plus Americans. That's why Biden and his gunslingers can do so with no consequence, without so much as a wrist slap from moderates and independents who theoretically know better. The Democrats' ability to intimidate well-meaning Americans is that great. Is this too blanket a condemnation? Where then is the Democrat who was outright raged by the four-year Russia collusion hoax and the failed coup and impeachment attempts, all of which accused the president without a shred of evidence of treason? Where was the Democrat who dissented from the public lynching of an exemplary public servant, Justice Brett Kavanaugh, over an incident that never happened 37 years ago at a time when he was a high school kid? Where is the Democrat who has condemned the violent street criminals of Antifa and Black Lives Matter who got away with conducting the most destructive civic insurrection in American history, orchestrating mayhem and disrespect for the law that led to the murders of scores of people who happened to have been mainly black? Democrats are not Democrats. They are totalitarians. They have declared war on the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Electoral College, the Senate, the Supreme Court, the election system, and the idea of civil order. They have called for the Republican president of the United States to be deplatformed and jailed. Their obvious goal is a one-state party that criminalizes dissent. To them, support for such basic necessities as borders and law enforcement are themselves racist. If you oppose their efforts to legalize infanticide, they will condemn you as enemies of women. And if you make videos of their confessions to selling body parts of murdered infants, they will, like Kamala Harris, throw you in jail. Progressives are not progressive. They are reactionaries. They are out to abolish liberal value systems and create a status hierarchy where race, gender, and sexual orientation define and confine you to an unalterable place in their new social order. If you are white or male or heterosexual or religious, Justice Kavanaugh was all for, you are guilty before the fact. But if you are a member of a designated but increasingly imaginary victim group, you are innocent even when the facts show you are guilty, like the reprehensible female who lied to Congress in a calculated attempt to destroy Kavanaugh's life and career. If you are a member of a victim group, you have an unlimited license to persecute others. Thus, the LGBTQ lobby is currently behind a nationwide campaign to strip Christians of their First Amendment rights and criminalize their religion. They use their victim status to leverage their hate of people who don't embrace their agendas and deploy it to crush them, and only Republicans seem to care. 
identity politics is a pure form of racism, and yet Donald Trump is the only Republican I'm aware of who has had the political spine to call a Democrat a racist. Identity wokeism is a totalitarian politics because it encompasses every aspect of life down to the pronouns one is ordered to use. The progressive police state will leave no space free. Perhaps now we can understand what Ronald Reagan said in 1964. The Cold War will end through our acceptance of not undemocratic socialism. So will the post-Cold War. I say perhaps for a reason. It is both a question and a worry. This country has changed so very, very much in respect of things we used to consider foundational and civilizational. Where once we esteemed rugged individualism, we now are too tempted by its opposite. Herbert Hoover put it this way, saying, there are two systems, rugged individualism and European philosophy of diametrically opposed doctrine, doctrine of paternalism and state socialism. The acceptance of these ideas would have meant the destruction of self-government through centralization and the undermining of the individual and initiative and enterprise through which our people have grown to unparalleled greatness. He closed by saying this, by adherence to the principles of decentralized self-government, ordered liberty, equal opportunity, and freedom to the individual, our American experiment in human welfare has yielded a degree of well-being unparalleled in the world. It has come nearer to the abolition of poverty, to the abolition of fear, of want, than humanity has ever reached before. The greatness of America has grown out of a political and social system and method of a lack of governmental control of economic forces distinctly its own. Our American system, which has carried this great experiment in human welfare farther than ever before in history, and I again repeat that the departure from our American system will jeopardize the very liberty and freedom of our people, will destroy equality of opportunity, not only to ourselves, but to our children." Close quote. We best grow up and get this right and fast, lest we, to borrow again from Ronald Reagan, spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like to live in the United States where men were free. I'm Seth Liebson. We'll be right back.